Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. In this video, we will explain the transparotid retromandibular approach. The retromandibular approach exposes the entire ramus from behind the posterior border. It may therefore be useful for procedures involving the area on or near the condylar neck head or ramus itself. The distance from the skin incision to the area of interest is reduced in comparison to that of the submandibular approach. There are two varieties of retromandibular approaches used to access the posterior mandible. They differ in placement of the incision and the anatomic dissection to the mandible. The transparotid approach that has the advantage of the close proximity of the skin incision to the area of interest. The retroperotid approach that has the advantage of not dissecting through the parotid gland. The face lift or retrodectomy approach can be considered as an alternative to retromandibular approaches. The main anatomic structures at risk in these approaches are the main trunk and branches of the facial nerve and, and the retromandibular vein. The relevant landmarks should be exposed throughout the procedure, keeping the corner of the mouth and lower lip within the surgical field interiorly and the entire ear posteriorly. These landmarks orient the surgeon to the course of the facial nerve and allow observation of the lip motor function. Here you can see the exposure offered by the retromandibular approaches, that is the transparotid and retroperotid. The skin is marked before injection of a vasoconstrictor. The incision for the retromandibular approach begins 0.5 centimeter below the lobe of the ear and continues inferiorly 3 to 3.5 centimeter. It is placed just behind the posterior border of the mandible and may or may not extend below the level of the mandibular angle depending on the amount of exposure needed. Epinephrine 1 is to 200,000 without a local anesthetic is useful although routine local anesthetic with a vasoconstrictor may be injected subcutaneously to aid hemostasis at the time of incision. One should not inject local anesthetics deep to the platysma muscle because of the risk of rendering the facial nerve branches non-conductive, making electrical testing impossible. Therefore, consideration should be given to using a physiologic solution with vasoconstrictor alone or injecting the local anesthetic with vasoconstrictor very superficially. Muscle relaxants used in general anesthesia can also impair nerve function and must be avoided. The initial incision is carried through skin and subcutaneous tissue to the level of the scant platysma muscle present in this area. Here you can see a vertical incision just posterior to the mandible through the skin and subcutaneous tissue to the depth of the platysma muscle. Extending from just below the ear lobe towards the mandibular angle. It should be made parallel to the posterior border of the mandible. Undermining the skin with scissor dissection in all directions allow ease of the retraction and facilitates closure. Hemostasis is then achieved with electrocoagulation of bleeding subdermal vessels. After retraction of the skin edges, the scant platysma muscle is sharply incised in the same plane as the skin incision. At this point, the superficial musculoepineurotic layer and parotid capsule are incised. Let's see how it is done. Sharp dissection through the thin platysma muscle, superficial musculoepineurotic system and the parotid capsule after undermining with a hemostate. At this point, the superficial musculoepineurotic layer and parotid capsule are incised and blunt dissection begins within the gland in an anteromedial direction towards the posterior border of the mandible. 
Here you can see the subcutaneous tissue has been undermined, exposing the superficial musculoepineuratic system. A vertical incision is made through the superficial musculoepineuratic system into the parotid gland. Bluntly dissect the parotid gland parallel to the direction of the facial nerve branches and towards the posterior border of the mandible. The dissection should be interior to the retromandibular vein. A hemostate is repeatedly inserted and spread open parallel to the anticipated direction of the facial nerve branches. In this figure, you can see blunt hemostate dissection through the parotid gland spreading in the direction of the fibers of facial nerve. The cervical branch of the facial nerve may also be encountered, but it is of little consequence as it runs vertically out of the field. However, in many instances, the marginal mandibular branch interferes with exposure. As we know that the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve is often but not always encountered during this dissection, so it interferes with exposure. So what will you do? It may be retracted superiorly depending on its location or may attempt to find with a nerve stimulator. Another useful adjunct in retracting the marginal mandibular branch involves dissecting it free from surrounding tissues proximally for one centimeter and distally for 1.5 to two centimeter. This simple maneuver determines whether the nerve is better retracted superiorly or inferiorly. Dissection continues until the only tissue remaining in the posterior border of the mandible is the periosteum of the pterygomesetric sling. One should also be aware of the retromandibular vein which runs vertically in the same plane of dissection and is commonly exposed along its entire retromandibular course. This vein rarely requires ligation unless it has been accidentally transected. It is pointed earlier that the branches of facial nerve may be found during the dissection. A nerve stimulator may be helpful to identify them. They should be identified and protected. Once the posterior border of the mandible has been reached, an incision is made through the pterygomesetric sling. The incision through the pterygomesetric sling along the posterior border of the mandible and the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve is being retracted superiorly and anteriorly. After retraction of the dissected tissues interiorly, the marginal mandibular branch uh, of the facial nerve under the retractor, a broad retractor is placed behind the posterior border of the mandible to retract the mandibular tissues medially. The posterior border of the mandible with the overlying pterygomesetric sling is visualized the pterygomesetric sling is sharply incised with a scalpel. The incision begins as far superiorly as is reachable and extends as far inferiorly around the gonial angle as possible. An incision in uh, the posterior portion of the sling bleeds less than an incision placed more laterally through the belly of the mesetric muscle. A periosteal elevator is used to strip the mesetric muscle from the ramus. Further dissection superiorly along the posterior border exposes the condylar process. Another view of subperiosteal dissection of the mesetric muscle, the periosteal elevator is used to strip the muscle fibers from the top to the bottom of the ramus. Sigmoid notch retractor, the curved flange at the end is inserted into the sigmoid notch retracting the mesetic muscle. Exposure uh, of the posterior ramus is seen. The sigmoid notch retractor is placed into the sigmoid notch, elevating the mesetic muscle, parotid and the superficial tissues. Here is another illustration of the amount of the exposure obtained during this approach. This is a clinical view of the excess gain 
the wound is reapproximated in layers for an atomic realignment and avoidance of the dead space. Two sutures are placed through the pterygomesetric sling as shown that parotid gland capsule must be closed tightly to prevent salivary fistula. The skin and subcutaneous tissues are then closed based on surgical preference. Consider anticholinergic medication, transcutaneous patch pushed post-operatively to decrease salivary flow and lessen the risk of salivary fistula. Aided exposure of the mandibular ramus is frequently required. Combinations of approaches such as pre-auricular and retro-mandibular offer increased exposure for some procedures such as those for temporomandibular ankylosis. If even greater exposure is required, one can connect these two approaches using a modified Blair incision. This incision is used frequently for operations involving the parotid, but it can be useful for those involving the mandibular ramus. This figure shows the modified Blair incision, the pre-auricular and Retromandibular approaches are connected by an incision hidden in the lobular crease of the ear. Here you can see the anterior posterior position uh, of the retromandibular portion of the approach may be customized. In this illustration, the incision parallels the sternocleidomastoid muscle and is more posterior than the retromandibular uh, approach as described previously. Thank you. Have a nice time.